Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. Now, today we're going to be talking about, again, another very mature topic. So if you're younger at heart or maybe not as mature as you think you are, this might not be the episode for you. We're going to be diving into a subject that I think affects so many people, they just don't want to admit it. They've been living in the shadows and hiding in those shadows for so long. Today, my guest, Rob, he's going to be digging into this subject of pornography. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, oh, that hurts a nerve. Uh, well, I hope it does, because today's episode is going to dig right into that, and he's going to share his story on how he came out of pornography and how he's the better for it. I hope you're ready, because you know I am. Let's go. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do, do something different Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And uh, today I get the privilege of sitting down uh, with a gentleman by the name of Rob. Now, uh, a little background uh, and maybe even a little introduction into this episode. This episode, as I said on the onset, is going to be really for mature listeners. So right now, if you're used to our kind of normal, family-friendly broadcast, uh, I would caution you to maybe take this into consideration of our topic today. We are going to be diving into the subject of pornography. And so with that as the onset, I want to just uh, clear the air on that, give you a moment to kind of digest that, like what on earth could we be talking about? But uh, but there we are, and uh, so I'm going to go over to Rob. Rob, welcome. Hey, hey. How are you? Happy to be here. Good. I'm good. So, a uh, little background on you. Like, is this a little tough for you to kind of dive into, to kind of now openly admitting to the world that maybe this was a struggle of yours? Um, it's not now. I think it was, it was like definitely a huge struggle when I was going through it all initially and when I got caught um, uh, from my uh, then fiance and had to kind of admit that this had been a problem all my life. It was hard then, but I've, I mean, I've given my testimony to individuals and in groups so much, like enough times at this point that, you know, I, I kind of almost uh, to a fault talk about it and talk about it in too much detail to the point where sometimes it might push people away when I probably should just read the room a little bit better. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so that's what that is what we're going to be talking about. So before we get into maybe the more serious stuff, let's get some uh, some fun stuff that I like to start with. So Rob, your shoe size is what? Nine and a half. Nine and a half? Small feet. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I was trying to think how to say that without sounding, not sounding like a jerk. Like, wow, dude, you're a, you're a dude and you're rocking nine and a half. Okay. Maybe 10. Okay. Are you like, pushing it? I'm Maybe pushing 10. It. All right. Do you have a favorite shoe that you choose to wear? Uh, yeah, I like Puma driving shoes. Puma? Mm -hmm. I like it. I don't, I, this is probably going to come as a shock to some. I don't own any Puma shoes. That's very surprising. Yeah. yeah In fact, Rob's Rob's making fun of me because before we started uh, this episode, uh, I switched my shoes from what I was wearing to now my Vans. And I told him, I said, I bought these shoes specifically on eBay used to really walk in someone else's shoes to really gain that perspective. So so there we are. Well, uh, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. So... Um, Tell us your story on kind of your, the evolution of when you first discovered pornography and then kind of um, maybe up until you met your wife, Mandy. Mm. So may, maybe okay. give us that in kind of a, a nutshell, uh, you know, but obviously not so uh, brief, but but enough that we can really gather what kind of that evolution of, of what took place. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um... I grew up in a broken family. Uh, my mom and dad were divorced. Um, basically, as I was coming out of the womb, my dad was nowhere to be found and kind of left her. And then the divorce papers came shortly after that. So um, he came back into my life when I was five, um, started fighting for custody of me, I think, when I was uh, around 10 or 11. Um, my first 
But my first interaction with pornography was when I was nine years old. I was staying at a friend's house, and my friend knew um, that his older brother was hiding magazines under um, his mattress. So he was like, hey, like, thought it was, you know, we're nine years old. We don't really know what we're looking at, but... um, he was like, this, my, my brother's got these magazines, got naked girls in it. And like we, you know, so we went and we looked at it and, uh, you know, we, I, I know that I, you know, we flipped through all the pages, but the very, very first image that I ever saw was a full page picture. Um, and I still, I can still to this day recall it, um, in complete detail. Um, uh, so that's just like a crazy crazy thing about um pornography at least for me and i know i've heard that um it's said of other people that it's like a really hard addiction because of the fact that it just like burns these images in your head um did but, you did you if i can jump in for yeah. a fast sec did you feel like it was wrong at nine what you were looking at no not i not at all i thought that it was i mean I, I felt like, I don't know, I, I felt like it was weird and it like made me a little bit embarrassed, I guess. But I remember like, you know, whatever, just like pretending to like touch the pictures on the page and like thinking it was funny, I guess. I don't know. Nine years old. I don't know. Maybe it just because, yeah, I mean, nine years old is before the age that, you know. Um, so so what year is this? Help, help me put it in context. What year? Uh, I was born in 91, so it was year 2000. Okay. So we, we have the internet. Uh, yeah, I did not have right. The no, at that point, but I'm saying but... we is the uh, the collective world. We we had the internet at this mm-hmm. point. Okay, it's so 2000. Yeah, the year 2000. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I didn't do anything. So you know, with those magazines and stuff, I, neither my friend or I knew what to do with the pictures, other than just you know they were naked people. Um, but it, but when when I turned 10, um, I was hanging out with a different friend. And, you know, we didn't look at any, you know, pornography or anything like that, but he, he explained to me how to masturbate. Um, and from there, like, I, I don't know what, you know, why it was so, it just made sense to me. I was like, okay, so I have this image in my head. Um, it causes me to feel aroused. Um, and now I have this like tool to use and I did it and felt good. And then that started kind of my path of, um, I, I was kind of addicted to masturbating so, from that point on. So how does that conversation go? You're at 10 now, right? Mm -hmm. A year later, and you're with, let's call him Tommy, right? Mm -hmm. You're hanging out with Tommy, and Tommy's like, hey, Rob, uh, not only do I have these, you know, naked magazines, but but this is what you do with them. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, like, at 10, I'm thinking about baseball. I'm not thinking about masturbating. Yeah. Um, It was like, um, uh, the way that I remember it um is it was nighttime and it was like bedtime so we were we were sleeping we were laying in different beds and we were just joking about stuff and he just you know joking he was like hey have you heard about how you can rub your you rub your penis up and down rub your dick up and down and and it feels good like you should try it sometime it's like it's hilarious like that it was just like this thing where you know he was like i dare you to do it kind of thing like it was just this Whoa. joking thing to do wow um okay yeah, and that's that's kind of where it was. Um, and I remember having kind of a, like even as a 10-year-old, having kind of a tense relationship with this kid. Like we would be playing sometimes and we'd get in fights and like not get along for a couple of days and like try to punch each other and stuff. But um, yeah, that's kind of how that went. Hmm. Um, so so you're 10, you're, you discover that, and then that uh, begins to birth, if you will, this behavior. Mm-hmm. Of, of doing this how often i mean um definitely once a day um i do remember there were days when i do it six seven times in a day um i remember at one night specifically that i did it four times in an hour um and that was so i had i learned how to masturbate and then when i was 11 my my uh my biological father who i would visit every other weekend um he got hbo and I realized because he let me stay up as late as I wanted, I realized that it, you know after eleven o'clock, that's when the movies HBO, came on. That's when the softcore porn was yeah. was on. I, I mean, sure. that was like the best thing in the world to me. I would just stay up all night watching that. Um, and um, yeah, so it went from there. And then um, back in my mom's place, where I was most often, um, we got dial up, um, dial up internet. 
and I would use the home computer. And sometimes even when like it was daylight, um, daytime and people were in the house, but just not in the living room where the computer was, I would like try to load up, um, some images, um, just to like look at, to like try to remember for later when I was, uh, wanting to, wanting to masturbate, wanting to jack off. Um, and yeah, so some I, people don't realize what dial up internet is, by the way. I'm just <laughs> a little, add a little levity to what you're saying just for a quick second, but but um, that's insane. Just kind of your journey mm. so far, yeah. And and you know, I, I know now that the reason why I did that is um, a big part of it is because while my my mom and my dad were going through um, their custody battle over me, which I mentioned um, as like a preface to the story um, is they, you know, they would constantly ask me, who do you want to live with? And my dad would even, you know, he would, he would pitch, pitch it this way as like an extra to add like extra weight to it. He, he would say, you know, this, this custody battle is costing me a lot of money. Um, so who do you want to live with? Because if you tell me that you want to live with your mom and you don't want to live with me, this custody battle can be over right now. Um, but if you say you want to live with me, then I will continue to fight this custody battle. And, you know, as an adult, we'd say, Oh, well, obviously then you say, you know, I'm just going to live with my mom because then that saves everybody grief and all that sort of stuff. But as a kid, um, I'm nine, 10, 11 years old. Like I don't, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if I tell him, I don't want to live with him then because of the way he is, like he will be mad at me forever. He won't be my dad anymore. And I love him. I, he's my dad. I love that he's in my life. We have a lot of fun together. So I'm never going to tell him I don't want to live with him. I want to live with him as a kid. I, I feel like I like any kid wants to live with his or her parents. Like, so I don't feel like, like I was, I was not lying to either parent when I told both of them that I wanted to live with both of them. Um, but I, I felt super, really insecure because I felt like at any point in time, I was going to lose one of my parents. Um, and pornography gave me that, gave me momentarily a sense of security. I had a relationship with this girl that I was looking at. I could fantasize about having this like super intimate, super awesome sexual relationship and, uh, you know, and then masturbate and have, you know, have that release of endorphins that just felt instantly good. And I was escape I had escaped everything at that point only had this feeling to focus on and this fake relationship with this image. Um, and that gave me a sense of security, which helped to build this behavior that I had. So fast forward, you're in middle school. How, how was that? Uh, middle school, I had, um, at that point, I had been given a computer in my room. Um, so and this, if, this is about, again, year-wise? uh year wise uh it's going to be what 2004 5 6 okay cuz i graduated in 09 so 2004 2005 such six. a baby <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> i graduated in 99 so there we are uh i don't mean disrespectful you're not a baby right, but right. but you're younger than i am yeah um which is still fascinating to me because to me i think that be that that breeds into this idea that pornography starts so young and in our society it is just rampant and and kids are seeing it earlier and earlier like at nine like i said i'm thinking about baseball i'm thinking about you know baseball cards yeah uh i'm not even that like pornography is not even on my radar yeah just and again just different perspective so yeah, so I hadn't, I hadn't gone through like you know at nine you haven't even gone through puberty so i was like there's like like not even any testosterone driving that sexual right. desire right um, which so, is yeah, important to which is important to point out as well so middle school still obviously still battling this behavior you get your computer and then and then it just continues. It just grows. Yeah, it grew. It just continued to grow. And I remember um, I got caught by my mom and dad and they grounded me for a couple of weeks, um, took away my computer, but then, you know, gave it right back. And it was really like, hey, you shouldn't do that. And how does that conversation go? Like, is your dad like, hey, way to go, son? Like, proud of you? <laughs> like, I mean, no, it was, no, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. Okay. Um, it, it it was definitely a sit down. Like this is not like you should not be doing. You shouldn't be looking at this. 
Um, these are not appropriate. Um, my mom um, told, you know, they both told me it gives me an unrealistic expectation of women. That was kind of their main bent as, as to why I shouldn't do it. Um, unrealistic expectation of women. I had also, um, which I, which is more and more prevalent today, um, uh, hentai or cartoon pornography. Okay. Um, is that like anime? Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. So. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's porno- okay. pornographic anime. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Um, I, that's, that's what they caught me looking at. So even more so they're like that, like women are not like, this is a cartoon. Right. Women are not like this. They're never going to be like this. Um, and that was kind of the, the story that they told. And then, um, and I was like, yeah, whatever. But I, like, I didn't change at all. And I, I cried and I was super apologetic. Um, and I, I cried and was like shaking in fear and, and was super sad that I had been caught because I was worried about the relation. I was worried that I was going to lose my parents again. Like I was worried that they were never going to trust me again and that they were never going to, they were going to stop loving me. Um, but then I caught, I got caught by my biological dad and it was more along the lines, along, along the lines of like, way to go. But it was more like, Hey, instead of doing that, you should just go find the real thing. Like, sow your wild, sow your wild Oh my oats, gosh. Um, okay. Was, was so like his promoting his, you know, promoting premarital sex mm-hmm. and, uh, and promiscuity. Promiscuity. And, yeah. Yep. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So then high school hits, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are you active as far as like premarital sex or I mean, no. had you acted out on that at all? Um, I mean, uh, we kind of talked, uh, we talked on Thursday about like the whole idea of like, Oh, I'm not sticking my dick in her vagina. So right. it's not sex. <laughs> um, but, uh, by the way, at a men's group at church, this comes up. So let's put that <laughs> into context. We'll get to that in a second, but, but, but yeah, yeah Rob um, did say that, which was a truth bomb in itself. <laughs> so there it is. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess I would have to admit at this point that, yeah, I, I mean, I was actively having premarital sex, just not, I, in my mind, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sticking my dick in her vagina, so I wasn't actually having sex. You know, it was like, you, you weren't was having going, intercourse by yeah, definition. I wasn't, okay. I was, I was given oral and getting oral and, you know, we were, you know, hands on and just fooling around all the time. Um, I was doing that, uh, with whatever girlfriend I had, um, and, and still looking at pornography. Yes. Which actively, by the way, probably now faster internet than dial up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Charter. (laughs) Yeah. Just throw that in there. Yep. Um, Yeah. We had, yeah, we had satellite internet. Um, yep. And yeah, so I was actively looking at porn. Um, I think I had kind of like, because probably because of the fact that I was fooling around with my girlfriends at, at school, um, like my pornography was like less, you know, whereas when I was in middle school, I was probably masturbating four or five times a day, um, at its maximum. It was like kind of a, I'm going to use it to be able to go to sleep better kind of thing. Like once a day, um, before bed sort of thing. Um, just as I felt like I needed to get that fix in. Um, it's interesting that you call it a fix. Why? Why do you call it that? I mean, I have some ideas, but but why do you call it a fix? Because uh, I felt I I would start to feel like I need like I it was a need that I felt like I had like I um I don't know it it started consuming when when it started being the only thing I could think about um then I knew like that's when I was like all right like I need to I need to look at porn and and jack off because it, because I was distracted. So now we're in high school. Has has any counselor come into your life? Any mentor? Any figure uh, of authority come into your life to say, "Hey, Rob, what you're doing?" You know, I mean, you're, you mentioned your parents a few times, but is there that figure that comes in to say, "No, this needs to stop. This is a bad behavior. Mm, needs no. to knock it off." Mm-mm. No, because I um, my parents never told anybody else. You know, they kept it in the family, um, so they kept it a secret. Hmm. Yeah, and and you obviously kept it a secret. Yeah, absolutely. Girlfriends yeah. never knew that you Correct. were doing yeah. this. My yeah. girlfriends never knew that I looked at okay. porn. I never talked to them about. It. I never like invited them in because, you know, I had been told it gave me an unrealistic expectation of women, and I had gathered from how offended my mom was that I was looking at porn that women did not like a boy or a man looking at pornography. So I definitely was like, I'm not. I'm going to make sure that my. Um, 
my girlfriends don't know anything about it. Um, definitely not going to talk to my friends about it. And I had a group of friends that were uh, Christians. Um, so I had started and, you know, and all through this time I had been going, been going to different churches. So I'm sure that there had been some, like I had picked up some tidbits of like, you know, sexual immorality is wrong. Um, and probably somebody had said at some point pornography was bad. Um, so I wasn't going to talk to any of my friends about it either. Um, I, I remember even in middle school, um, bragging and telling my friends that I had quit masturbating even though i was masturbating four or five times a day like i was like yeah i i don't even masturbate anymore like I, that's how good i am like that's how good of a christian i am like you guys struggle with masturbating and i don't at all like that i don't know why but you know, just as a, a piece of like this fake identity that i could create that would give me a you know a larger than life persona or something so this is a terrible story i'm going to tell you <clears throat> so i went to a church camp and um growing up and I'm probably about a sophomore in high school. And um, at the church camp, the, they brought a speaker in, right? And he, it's a guy session, only guys. And he, you know, guys and uh, high schoolers and, and middle schoolers, which I'm not even sure why that was in the room, but whatever. No judgment on that leadership. Um, but the speaker starts talking about how many of you have held hands with a girl? Mm. And, you know, a couple of people raise their hand. I, I think almost everybody raised their hand. How many of you have hugged a girl? You know, and he's obviously not talking about your mom or your sister or a cousin. I mean, he's talking about girlfriend, right? And then he's like, how many of you have kissed a girl? You know, obviously everyone's hands up. How many French kissed? You know, a couple hands dropped down. How many of you have, you know, touched her, you know, her boobs? And, you know, a couple hands again dropped down. You know, how many of you have, and he goes pretty graphic. How many of you touched her vagina? You know, a couple hands dropped down. How many of you have actually had intercourse sex with her? And, like, nobody's hands up. Nobody like, and I think the room was silent, like pin drop silent. And I'm sitting there going, wow, where's he going with this? Mm -hmm. And he says, do you realize right now you are most likely statistically speaking, you're most likely doing this with someone else's wife. I'm 39. Like I said, I was probably about 16, 17 at the time, probably 15, 16 at the time. Like that has stuck with me. That has stuck with me. Any of those thoughts ever enter into your head that what you're doing, not only, you know, in the masturbating aspect of it and the, and the pornography, that really you're looking at someone else's daughter, which is all in itself pretty mm -hmm. disturbing, but you're doing that potentially with somebody else's wife. I had never, never heard that. That is, that is crazy. Um, crazy to think about and a hundred percent true. I'm not with any of the girls I was with in high school. Right. No disrespect to those girls. Yeah. Hopefully they're, they're well and they're mm -hmm. fine and they have great marriages. And, but to me, that is why pornography is so damaging. If I'm going to, you know, put that out there. Cause I am going to put that out there. It is damaging. Mm -hmm. Um, but, so what made you finally say enough's enough? No, uh, definitely wasn't, definitely wasn't me. Um, uh, I guess I guess the 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 thing that made me decide that enough was enough uh, was when I was engaged to my now wife uh, Mandy and we were living together, um, still not having intercourse but fooling around doing everything else. Um, so wait, you're like living in the same house, mm -hmm. not married, right? But still not having sex. Not having intercourse. And by the way, Mandy, just she's not here, but yes. we can say this. She knows all this. Yes. None of this is probably news to her. No. Um, I'm, uh, I want that clear, yeah, too. She knows, yeah, she she knows, knows Rob's story. Yeah. So we're not we're not saying anything that, that Mandy isn't going to be like, oh, my gosh, that's a shock. <laughs> you know. So, OK, I, I think we should probably should have said that at the onset. But 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 it bears repeating if we if we didn't. So. So yeah, anyway, she, so she, so you're now living together. This is now post high school. Mm, you're post living high together. School. Yeah. OK. And so. So talk and she, about that. And um, we were we getting ready to go on a date, and um, I had looked. I had been in the bathroom uh, before we left for the date, and in the bathroom I was looking at porn and masturbating. Um, and then came out of the bathroom, put my phone down on the couch, and was putting my shoes on. And I had not exited out of the video that was on my phone. And she picked up um, my phone to get on Google Maps to be able to, you know, to see how far away. Um, dinner was going to be and she saw the video 
um, freaked out, you know, was crying, um, slammed the door, locked herself in the bedroom. Obviously, we didn't go on the date at that point um, and uh, said, you know, she was extremely upset, said she probably wasn't going to marry me. Um, and thankfully we had been going through, we had started going through, um, I don't actually, I don't know if we had started going through pre-marriage counseling yet, but we had Craig and Lisa Greatman in, um, the church that, uh, the church that we were both attending and, um, and he, we knew, you know, uh, Craig was somebody who was really open about his testimony and we knew that he had had, uh, different struggles, uh, sexual struggles and that sort of thing. So we knew that he was a good resource to reach out to. Um, and, um, uh, if I remember correctly, Mandy was the one that was like, you need to go, you need to go talk to Craig. You need to go admit to Craig, um, what you've been doing. And then on Sunday, we're going to tell Dawn because I was also part of the worship team. Um, so we felt like it was necessary. Well, Mandy thought that it was necessary for me to, um, tell the pastor of the church that I was looking at porn because I mean, I'm leading people in worship. So, um, uh, it could be a stumbling block for, for people who are new, for who are new believers and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so that so in that um, initially, I decided, well, I need to I need to be done with pornography because I want to marry this woman. Like I had already asked her to marry me, and she said, and she hadn't like completely closed the door. So um, I wanted to be rid of it for her. Um, still not really realizing the details of like why it was so wrong. Um, and you because all this time you're you're still feeling like, hey, there's nothing wrong with this, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, other than her being upset and your parents being upset mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe subconsciously, again, like you said, through the youth years of, of going to church on and off, you know, kind of hearing sort of the, through the grapevine that this was wrong, but never really truly believing that it was wrong. Right. Okay. Not enough that it was going to, yeah. Not enough that, not it enough that it's not changing your world or exactly. stopping these behaviors. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, and – um yeah, and it really, it really made me a, like I was a robot. Um, and Mandy, you know, we would be on dates sometimes, and Mandy'd be like, "You have no emotion whatsoever." And at that, and at that point, she didn't, she didn't know why. She just thought that I was like struggling with expressing myself or something. Um, but really, it was just because I was constantly thinking about pornography. Like it, it was, um, it was something that was always on my mind. Something that I always wanted to be doing. And no matter who I was with, no matter what, you know, no matter where I was at. But, but Rob, help me. You're a musician. Mm-hmm. You're a pretty accomplished musician in a lot of respects, right? I mean, I mean, a little braggadocious moment right here for you. But, I mean, you play the saxophone. You play the piano. You sing really well. I mean, you're musically talented. Music is not in any way capsulating your life or driving your life. I think this behavior been... became more than that. Yeah, definitely the behavior was more than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess um, a detail that, you know, it's it's not really a, um, it's not a part of my active testimony, but since you bring up music as something that um, is, is is a big part of my life, and it is and it always has been, and it has been um, a lot of times like an escape that has won over um, pornography. But when I, when I was in college, my first year of college, um, I would practice my saxophone probably four four to six hours a day and a lot of times that would that would end up being um at like 12 1 in the morning i would go to a practice room at 12 or 12 12 a.m or 1 1 a.m and practice for three hours um but what ended up happening is that like an hour to an hour and a half, like you know if i an hour to two hours of the time that i spent practicing i was actually on my laptop masturbating in the practice room. So, um, yeah, hmm. as, as an example of how, yeah, it was, you know, music was a huge part of my life. So I was at the practice room practicing my saxophone, but had this huge thing that, you know, I had, like I had to, I had to jack off. I had to look at porn and like, didn't matter where I was at or what I was doing. I was in, 
you know, I was like, I'm, I'm in a private space. Nobody's going to come in. Um, you know, there's this thing that people did where they, cause there's like little windows to be able to see that people are in the practice room, but people had this thing where they would put a towel over the window so that, you know, they could have, have complete privacy while they're practicing. So I just did that. So people knew that there was somebody in there that they wanted privacy. Um, and I had roommates, so it was, I got to be in a place where I wasn't with my roommates, uh, hmm. to masturbate. So, uh, yeah. So you and Mandy end up getting married. Mm-hmm. You do. I mean, that is a great end of the story, but it's not the end of the story. Right. So how many more times after being married did, did Mandy catch you um, she, with uh, pornography? So um, thankfully I have not um, fallen back into pornography since we've been married. Okay. Um, but uh, she did. So she caught me this first time while we were engaged living together. And honestly, you know, the, the experience of being married happens the moment that you move out with somebody at least in my mind um the struggles that i see newly married couples going through um are the struggles that mandy and i went through the the moment that we moved out together so so i would say yeah um that as kind of a preface but she caught she would catch she would catch me three times total the first time before you get married before i got married so after you're married now because you guys have been married how long again uh, we've been married for seven years. Seven years. So in that Together seven, for ten. in that seven year period since you've been married, no pornography, no anything. Correct. Yeah. There's been. That's awesome. There has been um, times where there's been like little times, like when we used to go to the gym, that I had to um, admit to Mandy that I was looking at some of the women that were in the gym, um, and that I like had had temptations and wanted to masturbate. Um, uh, there's been there was a time where. Uh, um, we had been going through some tough stuff and I had stayed up late and Mandy had gone to bed and I had, I had pulled, grabbed like an old laptop. We had an old MacBook um, that was from when I was in college um, that didn't have accountability software on it. Accountability software, just for anybody listening, is basically spyware that sends reports to people that you choose um, and they get to see everything that you look at on the internet. So, and I have that to this day, just as a protection to myself and others. Um, but, uh, I had grabbed a computer that I knew didn't have this accountability software on it and had full intentions of looking at porn that night. But, um, for whatever reason, um, whatever, you know, whatever your beliefs might be, I, and it could have just been me, you know, in my mind's eye de- creating this aberration, but that's what it was is out of the corner of my eye. So I'm in the living room and, and to my right is a, um, is a hallway down, you go down the hallway and then you can be in the master bedroom. So out of the corner of my eye down the hallway, I saw like a silhouette of, you know, just a, a, a shadow is basically what it was and i would like look over to down the hallway and i would see nothing and i look back at the computer start to like type out the website a little bit more and then out of the corner of my eye see that silhouette again so that happened three or four times and i was like all right something is like i am sketched out beyond belief i don't know what's going on but this is not like at that point the aberration the like shadow that i kept seeing was more of a focus than me wanting to masturbate so um i decided f- for whatever reason that i wasn't gonna look at porn that maybe this was like this is a demon trying to like get me to look at porn and i was like all right this is the battle like i'm gonna i'm gonna win this battle now that i realize what's happening um but that was probably that was the last time that um and that was two uh, two or three years ago maybe so so Rob, to me, I'm always curious uh, when I sit down with people, but why would you want to come on and talk about such vulnerable stuff? Because uh, I think, because um... this is, I mean, this is, this has been awesome. I mean, maybe not for you to share it, but, but hearing it, to, I mean, it, awesome from the standpoint of how, how vulnerable you are, how real you are, how, you know, I mean, just how transparent you are even so so first off let me say thank you and then if you're willing answer why would you want to come on and talk about this Mm -hmm. um i 
even more so today because I have friends that I talk to on a regular basis now that think that it's just a like a joke and it's something that guy like I, I don't know when there was a turning point in in the world where guys just like openly talk about porn and masturbating and stuff but it, uh um it messes up relationships and it messes it messes up um it messed up my mind and I firmly believe that it does that with um, men as well. I feel like it's a huge, a, a huge problem that gets um, mulled over as just a something light and silly and something that people do, and it's not at all. Um, it's not at all. It, um, it basically screwed up most of my childhood and uh, most of my high school years, if not like all of my high school years, like just were consumed completely by pornography gave me completely unrealistic expectations of my wife. Um, it, um, you know, uh, going through, I went through celebrate recovery for it and, um, celebrate recovery is a 12 step program like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but for all sorts of addictions, including pornography, um, and Craig, uh, my sponsor, he made me read these, uh, testimonials of like women that were in porn and, um, how they had like come out of it and how there's like this pressure to, um, you know, if you're uncomfortable doing something on set, um, here's these narcotics to, um, dull your senses so that you can handle it more. Um, you know, um, be promiscuous outside of work. Um, you know, you, and don't get, don't get fat or ugly or else you're not, you know, you're not gonna make any money. It will, will kick you out and, you'll never find something else like it, the the entire industry is extremely manipulative and evil and all of these women that you know that I was watching that look like they're having the time of their lives like they're depressed and I, I even um I can't think of the the uh, porn star's name but um uh, I know I know the one that I watched regularly committed suicide like killed herself over um because she couldn't handle you know she was just so uh depressed and and it just completely skews and ruins the self-worth of a human being um and uh i think it's important for that aspect and, and i think it's extremely important because uh um for me i have i still to this day struggle with having an addictive addictive personality towards anything it doesn't matter what it is if there's something that gives me some sort of endorphin kick or makes me feel a sense of power or security i have to be really really careful to not make it an idol or make it something um that consumes my my day-to-day -day life and i think porn does that for um anybody that watches it so there's evidence that speaks that porn actually can create brain damage um there's some scans that i found in preparing that actually they, they show a heroin brain and a porn brain, and they're very identical, which is crazy to think about. So do you, do you think that there is some truth to that, or do you think it's just poppycock? Um, I, I would definitely think that there's truth to that. I would, yeah, I would, I would believe that. Um, yeah. Okay. I have, I have friends that, um, are still actively addicted to pornography that I feel like are probably like they're socially awkward to the point that I feel like that they would be a good evidence. Uh, okay. The, the other truth that this site recommends or, or sites is that uh, porn can thin out your wallet. Now, I don't know, you know, how often you're paying for things, but there are obviously are sites that you can go to that you can pay for. There's, I'm sure there's, especially the way this information ages nowadays. Right. And it's multi billion dollar industry. Yeah, it's multi billion so dollar are, industry. Mm -hmm. People are probably, you know, torrenting it and doing things like that to, to make it free. But the other thing that it robs, at least in my mind, um, is it robs your time, mm -hmm. right? So that's a way of thinning out your wallet as well, is it's eating up your time. And yeah. obviously you spoke about that quite a bit at length, mm -hmm. just how much time you spent. So obviously you agree with that statement as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe I might, you know, who knows, who knows where I, you know, I could be today if, um, if I didn't have an addictive personality, if I didn't, um, spend all that time looking at pornography, um, 
yeah, I could have accomplished so much more. And I know that, you know, uh, uh, video game addiction more recently has, um, limited, uh, limited my growth as well. So the other truth that they cite, there's five of them. So this is number three, uh, porn, not might, not could, no porn will destroy your marriage. Would you agree with that? I know you're not actively, you know, obviously you, you've made that change in the last seven years, which is mm. to me is awesome, monumental. Um, but imagine if you had kept those behaviors into your marriage, do you think that would have one day destroyed your marriage? And if so, maybe speak about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, Mandy, Mandy was, uh, extremely forgiving through all this and wanted to see me beat my addiction. So that's why she stayed. And that's why she, you know, she forgave me and we eventually got married because she could see that I wanted to make a change. Um, but if, uh, if I had shown that I didn't want to change, if I didn't change and continued to, um, you know, seek out pornography and I was doing that actively, definitely we would not be married today. Um, uh, it just like for the first two years after Mandy and I got married, even, even though I wasn't looking at pornography, we, we had sex maybe once or twice a month, maybe. Um, and we would try to have sex a lot more often. Um, but we, we would end up, we, you know, we'd get into bed uh, ready to, you know, ready to have sex. And then she would, uh, be completely turned off to it all and be like, I just, you know, remembered the video that I saw you watching on your phone. And I like, I can't, I can't do this. Like I, I can't have sex with you because I'm, I'm just worried that you're going to be fantasizing about these things that you've seen. So it, I mean, it was a, it took years of, of resolution for us to fully be through my addiction to pornography, even though I wasn't active in it. So if I was active in it, I mean, yeah, um, she would have felt she had no value. She would have felt completely unattractive. Um, and even though that wasn't the case, like, um, um, I never looked at porn even while with her because she wasn't beautiful and I wasn't sexually attracted to her. It was not about, it wasn't about her not being enough at all. It was about just this thing that I had to do that I was addicted to. Like it, it, it wasn't about, I didn't think about her at all, which was another problem, you know, not thinking about her, but it, it wasn't about her. I didn't, it, when I was doing it, it was, there was no person that I was thinking about other than myself. Um, and that also would have destroyed the marriage because, you know, marriage is two people that live together that are supposed to support and think of each other. Now, I know you guys don't have kids currently. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, maybe this will be tough to answer, but, uh, and truth number four is porn can have devastating effects on children. Now, obviously you can't speak to that from a parent standpoint mm -hmm. per se, but you can speak to it even about, you know, you as a kid. I mean, have you thought back, really thought back to how damaging that was to you as a kid to see all that? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I haven't thought about specifically how I I'm like, I know how much it damaged, damaged my life, but as a kid, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as a nine year old, I should be thinking about baseball. I shouldn't be thinking about naked women like that. I mean, not all that sort of stuff. Like who, you know, um, um, I already mentioned the addictive personality that I struggle with today. Like maybe I wouldn't have that. And that would be, I mean, it's, it's a burden that is very heavy and hard to bear sometimes. And it would be really nice to be, to be free of that. Um, and I, you know, you know, if by, by some miracle I could be, but I, I don't see that I will ever be free of it, which is, which is fine. Like I can live a full and happy life while still recognizing my weaknesses. Um, but yeah. I definitely think that was created in me from a very young age hmm. because of porn. And the last truth is uh, porn can lead to other sins. Now, you and I know what that word is, sins, because mm -hmm. we're you know, kind of church-going folks and, and whatever. But you could even say, you could even take out that word sin and lead to other behaviors that affect a relationship. Lying, you know, obviously um, hiding things, which mm -hmm. is, you know, obviously a form of lying. But 
but even just you know stealing your you know time away from your wife or your girlfriend or you know whatever so um do you think that that has further ramifications other than than just you know lying yeah i mean i I already i already mentioned my addiction to video games um you know i i almost lost my marriage to a video game addiction in 2016 um and that you know that is a repercussive addiction due to my addiction to pornography um so that i mean and yeah a sin anything that damages relationships um i was an impulsive liar when i was addicted to porn um definitely was addicted to have always struggled with being addicted to video games um um and like i mentioned only thinking about myself so um i would even lie to myself and think that i was in like in high school when i was you know i dated three girls in high school both you know all of them for like nine months to a year um two of them for a year and a half each um and I would lie to myself and say that I had like a wholesome and deep relationship with these women, but really all I wanted from them was to fool around and cuddle. Um, and you know, I would lie and manipulate my way, um, through that, both them and myself. So yeah, pornography has a lot more, it's not just about the addiction to porn. So a wise man once said to me, Any man who says he's never struggled with lust is lying to himself. What do you make of that statement? Um, Yeah, I think I... uh... Lying to himself is a sticking point. Like, not a sticking point to me, but um, is a... uh is a call out for me lying to himself because yeah, there could be people that fully believe that they've never struggled with lust. Um, but I would challenge those people to actually sit down and, um, try to analyze theirs. You know, it's hard. It's hard to think, think how, how do you think it's hard to think like, how do I communicate? How, how do I dialogue with myself? Um, all of those kind of like interpersonal analysis, um, is really hard. So I would say, yeah, you're probably lying to yourself. You just don't know it. So I'm going to give a little of my story, um, just so you can maybe feel a little better. (laughs) (laughs) So my story starts about eighth grade and, uh, and I found my mom's probably going to freak out right now. (laughs) Um, I found a, a videotape of my brothers, VHS, just put it into context. And so um, I, I'm so embarrassed to say this. Uh, not only did I watch it, but then this is where it gets bad. Is a very good friend of mine, and I'm going to call him Tommy, just because I don't I don't know where this guy is now, and privacy sake for him. But Tommy, uh, I invite him over to my house. And I say, dude, we're going to watch Dangerous Minds, the Michelle Pfeiffer movie. Mm -hmm. I think Coolio did Gangster's Paradise to it, right? So it gives you the context of that movie. I'm like, dude, we're going to watch Gangster's Paradise, right? So I throw it in the VHS player, cue it up to like the the one key scene that that I really liked and play the movie for him. Now, mind you, I don't know if he has any experience with pornography. I don't know if he's ever seen it. I don't know. But I have been haunted by the fact that what if, what if I was the one that turned him on to it? What if I was the one that introduced him for the first time looking at pornography? I don't know if I did or didn't, but the idea of that has haunted me uh, forever. Um, And, you know, my, you know, porn addiction goes from there, you know, through high school, you know premarital sex, uh, before high school, um, you know, met my wife and, um, you know, for me it was really hard too, um, because, you know, she got me a number of times as well. Prior to us getting married, I got caught by, you know, a mentor I lived with from church. Mind you, the whole time I'm in church leadership, keeping this a secret, much like you, mm-hmm. you know, keeping this a secret, not sharing it with anyone, um, not telling anyone because, you know, if you tell anyone, you're going to lose everything, yeah. you know. And I ended up actually 
<clears throat> being uh, hired as a pastor, being an associate pastor of a church, and uh, being a youth pastor even in some uh, you know facet of that, and um, losing a job because I went to the pastor, confessed to him after my wife caught me, um, went to the the church leadership and confess and said, Hey, you know, I've been struggling with this. Can I came back? Like it was good for a while. Then I came back again and, uh, ended up losing my, my job as a pastor because of it. And, you know, people get into like, Oh, you shouldn't have, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, you know, I don't subscribe to any of that. The church leadership made the decision that they made and, and it's taken some time, but I do, you know, obviously I, I support what they did now in hindsight. They did what they felt was best, but that was really hard. That was a really dark time because, you know, I grew up, that's all I wanted to be. You know, that's, you know, that's what I aspired to be. That's what people told me I should be, you know, and to then to finally hit that, that, that plateau, that platform. And like you were there. I you was there. Been. I tasted it, right? I arrived, right? Whatever you want to say with that. And then have it all come crashing down because of this choice of pornography. And I have had people say to me through the years, you know, you shouldn't have lost your job. I'm like, that's not the issue. They're like, they shouldn't have done that. I'm like, that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. They're like, this should have never happened. And I'm like, that's not the issue. And to me, um, it wrecked a lot of my wife and I's intimacy. And my wife and I have known Mm -hmm. each other for, gosh, we're 15 and 16 when we first met. So, I mean, we've known each other, obviously, most of our lives. Mm -hmm. And for me, the moment that caused me to change, that's why I asked about your moment. My moment was tears in her eyes saying, why am I not enough? Mm -hmm. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what you say. Rob's here today, too. I don't care what you say. If you say, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't hurt her. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself if you think it doesn't, because it does. Getting a little preachy. Sorry, people probably don't like that, but I don't care. It's my show. I can do what I want. But I, I wanted to give you that, Rob. And and I think part of the reason why I wanted to give you that is is to hopefully, not only you but to others, it it's not a one guy thing. It's yeah, not it's a not. it's not an isolated thing. Rob's not on an not island alone. of misfit toys. You're not alone. Yeah. Exactly that. I would echo that. You're not alone. So I know this was maybe a little hard to come on. We we kind of talked about it a little bit ahead of time, but um, but man, I just want to tell you, awesome, thank you, thank yeah. you for coming on and saying what you said, and and thank you for being willing to because I mean you could have easily said, I don't care, no, I'm pound sand, no, <laughs> no thanks, Neil, not going there, I'm not not going there, mm-hmm. but but I want to give you um, kind of the last word unless something jumps into my head, but I want to kind of give you the last word. What would you say? to nine-year-old Rob and maybe even 16-year-old Rob? So maybe two-part question. What would you say to nine-year-old Rob now and maybe 16-year-old Rob now uh, after you've walked through what you've walked through? Like you could jump in the DeLorean. That's back to the future reference, by the way. If you didn't. No, I got it. I got okay, it. all right. Yeah, yeah. I watched that as a kid. Okay, good. Um, but, if you could, but if you could go back in time and tell him, what, what would you tell him? Nine-year-old Rob, I would probably just tell him, I would tell him it's going to be okay. You're you're going to be okay. Your parents love you. You're not going to lose your parents. They both love you. You're not going to lose them. You're not going to lose them. Um, and, um, yeah, I would just... I would just help him to try to help him to realize that he he is loved um, because I was constantly in fear of losing the love of my parents then. So I think that would have really helped me to have that kind of uh, validation that I was secure because I didn't feel secure. And um, 16-year-old me, a teenage me that was just a... Uh, going through whatever I don't know if I would have heard it heard anything at 16 you know I you know I was pretty I thought I had the world figured out at 16 I still feel like I got the world figured out now but um I don't know I would just tell him to you know that 
Craig, Craig did something when I was going through Celebrate Recovery that was, um, you know, he 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 told me something that stuck with me, which was, um, how are you doing? Um, and if you tell me you're doing okay, and you're lying to me, that like that's no skin. Like I I can't make you tell me the truth, but um, um, what matters is is your relationship with you know God. And in you know I know this is not a religious podcast, but um, it doesn't matter if you lie to me. It that it's only going to influence you. Like you're only hurting yourself, kind of thing. And um, you know you can either you can make two decisions here. You can choose to um, find a better way to lie and keep it a secret forever. Or you can realize that you're not alone and you can be over this and you can have a better life and you can beat this. Um, And the choice is yours. Um, So I would tell 16-year-old me, you can continue. Feel free to, you know, I can't make you change. You can hide this forever if you want to and you can find better ways to lie keep it a secret forever um and you'll have a mediocre life or you can choose to try to beat this and have a fantastic life that isn't burdened by this weight and if you don't think that it's a weight on your shoulders um just think about what you think about on a daily basis Think about what you think about on a daily basis. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that um, my hope, anyone listening, and ladies, if you're listening, hopefully you haven't tuned out, hopefully. But ladies, if you're listening and you know there's a guy in your life that's struggling with this, have him listen to this. I mean, Rob has truth today. I mean, there have been, I mean, if we're going to put it on a boxing or a sports reference, you know, Rob came in kind of as Mike Tyson. He laid some some haymakers today. I, I like Tyson. <laughs> I like Tyson in the nineties, you know, when he was yeah. just destroying people. But but Rob, I mean, what you said really is tr- truth. It is your it is your truly your perspective. Mm-hmm. It, it truly did give you a sense of this gratification, this high, this ability to lie. I mean, you're probably one of the best politicians out there now because you know how to lie so well. <laughs> No disrespect to our politicians, but in a sense, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you really have. I mean, you, you really learn how to hide stuff and to keep stuff. And there was a sense of comfort there probably in, in keeping it a lie and keeping the, the secret going. But there's such, on the other side of that, there's such a weight of, of keeping it going mm-hmm. and keeping that lie alive. Like, I think, I don't know, it was my grandmother, maybe it was my mom, give credit where credit's due, but my mom or whoever would say, you know, if you lie once, you got to have like seven, eight, ten, twelve lies to back up that first lie, and then it just compounds Mm -hmm. because you have to keep this lie going. And guys, and I mean this guys, not guys and gals, but guys specifically hear me on this one, stop lying. Come clean. Yeah. Get free from it. You're not you alone. Can. People You're not will alone. help you. Absolutely. People will help you. You're not going to get like any any sort of real human being that's going to also be honest with you is going to tell you you're not alone and is not going to judge right. you and is going to help you and battle right. with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I would echo that. Um, okay. So let's play our game. A little levity to okay. our game. So this is a game I like to call Senseless. So uh, my uh, previous guests have not, some have not wanted to touch the cup because of the but you don't care. You're not a sports guy. You'll touch the cup. Yeah. So inside the cup, there's a dice. Mm. A die, I should say. Mm. I get corrected every time. But anyway, there's a die. So if you roll that, kind of like Yahtzee, a little Yahtzee action. There you go. And then you're going to, yep, there you go. Dump it out. Oh, fell on the ground. I just rolled it for you. You got a three. I don't like the number three. You should roll again because I rolled for you. <laughs> okay, well. Yeah. All right, Rob's going again. Round two. Oh, you got a five. Ooh. I like five. Five's fun. Uh, what's uh, what's your favorite thing to taste? My favorite thing to taste? Spicy yeah. food is the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Like wasabi? Mm, not wasabi. Like uh, buffalo sauce. Okay. Why? 
<laughs> so random uh, buffalo sauce. I, know. I don't know. I don't know. It's All just, right. Just first thing. I, I don't know if this game is supposed to be like a first thing come to mind. But, no, it was, uh, most of the time, yeah. Tangy and spicy um, and just full. Of, it's just uh, something that's full of flavor in my mind. So. All right. Spicy and full of flavor. Kind of like, kind of like you. You a little bit of buffalo sauce yeah, there. There you go. Spicy. Yeah, kind of spicy. Uh, Rob, I know I've I've said it a ton, but I'm going to say it one more time, just officially one more time, that I really do. Man, it's been awesome. Really good stuff. Yeah, thanks and, for inviting me. I think this is a cool forum that you have to try to reach people. Well, I'm trying. You know? I don't know. I don't know what happens. You know, kind of like back in the day, you probably don't remember this, but we used to send letters out to people. I don't remember that. Like post office letters. And sometimes we would get stuff back sometimes, but it kind of is like that. Like I'm sending this out, man, I don't know what's going to happen with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just hope, you know, help somebody today. I believe you helped somebody today. I think you had a lot of great stuff. And uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you again. And guys, just remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really, truly do get a different perspective. Again, thank you, Rob. Thanks for coming on. And this has been an episode of Other People's Shoes. Hopefully you want to listen to this. Hopefully you want to share this with those in your life, because that's my hope is, is that there's somebody out there right now that needs this uh, episode. Maybe it's you, you know, maybe it's your son, maybe it's your nephew, niece, nephew. I don't know. Maybe it's your cousin's uncle's brother's dad. I don't know. But, but guys, I believe firmly in this and I believe what Rob said today is powerful and it can change lives. So again, thank you for listening to other people's shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and please, of course, stay tuned to other episodes. Thank you so much for this time. Oh,